Dear distinguished Professor Emeritus Epstein, many thanks for accepting the proposal of the Brussels International Catholic School for this interview. I had the chance to meet you last summer during my visit to San Francisco Bay Area, and I was deeply impressed by your academic experience, both in the US and worldwide. You are distinguished Professor Emeritus of the University of California at Berkeley, former chair of Berkeley's Academic Senate and faculty advisor committee to the Athletic Study Center, dean of the School of Economics and Business Administration, academic advisor, mentor to students, associate dean of international relations. Moreover, you are board member of the John F. Kennedy University and the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Fellowship. For more than 40 years, you have lectured researched and published worldwide, including in the US, China, United Kingdom, Australia, Israel, Japan, Indonesia, Russia, and Italy. Thus, I am confident you may provide any international student who is about to enroll to university with very useful insight. The big yes, yes, no, no introduced are based on the concept of the Gospel of Matthew. Let your words be simply yes or no. Therefore, I would ask you to answer my questions always by starting with either a clear yes or a clear no. Do you agree to it? Yes, I do. Then let us start. I know that UC Berkeley is a 150-year-old founding member of the Association of American Universities. Thus, my first question is about the US university system, particularly from the perspective of international students. Let us consider UC Berkeley as a case study. UCB has 31,000 undergraduate students. According to full 2018 statistics, I have noticed that admission rate is only 18%. International students comprise only 13% of all undergraduate students. Now, as agreed, let me be very strict about it. Would you or would you not advise an international student to apply for undergraduate studies in the US? Yes, I would. Uh, first of all, uh, Berkeley is uh, one among many excellent institutions that uh, welcome and uh, indeed recruit international students. I would say that um, in terms of uh, Berkeley, you have to remember that it is a public university, that it has very distinct obligations to citizens of, um, of California. In fact, there's always uh, legislative oversight in terms of uh, how many California students are admitted and also of course its standards for admission are very very uh, high. All of that being said, uh, at least it's been my experience that uh, there I've had in my classes uh, consistently over the years international students who've done very well, uh, have been very successful at the uh, university. I would encourage students who uh, are really top quality uh, students to uh, apply, uh, students who are mature, students who can benefit from the international experience. Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, and international education and reciprocally students from the United States going abroad for junior year abroad or uh, for longer periods of time in uh, other countries. The UC Berkeley alumni, faculty members and researchers include more than 100 Nobel laureates in medicine, chemistry, physics economics, a dozen Pulitzer Prizes, and 207 Olympic medals. 
UCB researchers and labs have co-discovered 16 chemical elements of the periodic table, more than any other university in the world. Additionally, vitamin E, the virus influenza vaccine, carbon-14, bad and good cholesterol, biotech, open source software, the computer mouse, space dark energy, treatment for malaria, have all been either discovered or decisively developed by Berkeley's researchers. Of course, UCB has always been ranking internationally among the top world universities. Now, my point is that Berkeley has achieved it all as a public university, actually one of the best worldwide. While, for example, Stanford, a university nearby, which also carries an excellent reputation, is private. You have yourself a mixed public private education. In political science and law, MA at Berkeley, LLB at Yale, BA at the University of Pennsylvania. Hence, my second question is, generally speaking, would you say that the public or private nature of a university matters? Yes, I would. Uh, one of the distinguishing aspects of uh, Berkeley, as I found it in my years there, is its openness to um, students and um, faculty members to, what to say, to participate in its, uh, in its mission. Uh, Berkeley sees itself as not uh, just having an obligation to uh, students, but to the public uh, as a whole, as uh, a source of um, availability, uh, access to students who may come from um, uh, underprivileged backgrounds, uh, students who may um, show characteristics in addition to their uh, academic records that indicate that they have promised to be very successful students and very respect, uh, very uh, uh, successful contributors to uh, society. I say this advisedly uh, as a product of, uh, as you will point out, both, uh, a public institution, Berkeley, but most of my education was at two private institutions, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Yale uh, Law School, both Ivy League institutions. And I would say that uh, the private institutions very often have uh, uh, a certain sense of uh, privilege or entitlement uh, about them uh, and uh, in relationship to their public congregations. This was more so in my generation when I was going to these institutions than today. Uh, and both Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale, for example, uh, have taken a much greater commitment to the uh, neighborhoods, the communities in which they live. Uh, incidentally, both New Haven and the part of Philadelphia where uh, Penn exists uh, have typically been low income and uh, uh, minority uh, occupied communities. And now they feel much greater obligation to it, um, but still is not in the same spirit, same way that a public institution such as Berkeley uh, has, where it's just built into the mission, it's built into the culture, it's built into, indeed, uh, attracting students who see themselves as uh, having uh, public service obligations and not not just obligations wanting to uh, contribute to uh, uh, the public uh, uh, the public well-being for my next question i will build on the fact that uc berkeley is also number one 
full time top producer of Peace Corps volunteers, as well as gave birth to the free speech movement related to civil rights and anti war movements. During university studies, would you suggest engaging in campus activities such as recreational sports, student run organizations and newspapers, art classes, volunteering opportunities? Yes, because that's part of your educational experience. I mean, classes provide a, a certain aspect of uh, uh, your education, but uh, the interaction in uh, non-class uh, activities uh, with other students, students who you might not uh, meet in your classes because they have different uh, majors, come from uh, different backgrounds. It's a very important uh, dimension to it. Uh, students who um, engage in extracurricular activities uh, later on as alumni often feel a much richer, that they've had a much richer experience than those who focus full time uh, on their classes. There's another dimension to this public-private thing that occurs to me that I didn't uh, stress previously. Uh, at a place such as Berkeley, uh, a very uh, substantial number of students have to work uh, during the time that they are at the university to be able to support themselves. Uh, and this is uh, even where they receive financial support uh, by way of scholarship or loans or uh, uh, on-campus uh, on campus employment opportunities. Uh, so they have to work very hard for their education. Whereas at private institutions, while well, you still have students who have to support some aspect of their uh, education, this is a much uh, more infrequent uh, phenomenon. And they, in a, in a sense, have more of a sense of entitlement uh, to uh, uh, their education, uh, take it more for granted uh, than students who, who come to a, to a public institution. I mean, I can say this advisedly, having um, uh, been a product of both public and private, uh, having taught at both public and private, having been an administrator at both public and, and private. And uh, so it, it gives a, a different um, emphasis. Um, and um, I... Uh, I'm a great admirer of Stanford University, which is very close by, and in some respects is a sister institution because there's a great deal of intellectual interchange uh, between the two institutions, uh, irrespective of our football rivalry and sports rivalry. But there is just a, a different culture between the two institutions. And I'm not denigrating Stanford's worldwide reputation and excellence. I'm a great admirer of Stanford. But it's a different culture than we have at Berkeley. And the public private uh, distinction uh, makes the difference. Let us now move to a question strictly related to your academic field religion, ethics, and business. Is there or is there not an ethical influence of the various religions on the way businesses are differently run and managed all over the world? I would answer it this way. Um, the different religious traditions um, do have an impact on uh, the ethical climate of uh, a business in in various countries. How strong it is varies, and also, more to the point, it varies in terms of the companies, uh, uh, the, the different you know corporations, firms, 
and also those who are running them. Uh, there are some firms that have long-standing uh, uh, reputation for being uh, uh, ethical, and others who uh, are uh, uh, at times notorious for their lack of ethical behavior. Uh, I think that, um, you know, as one who is uh, very much committed to my own uh, religious tradition of Judaism, and also who has uh, been a dean at a Catholic institution, uh, it is, once again, it's a matter of, of, of culture. Um, and um, it, I, I wish I could say that uh, uh, religion is uh, a panacea that makes all businesses and all business people uh, ethical. It isn't, but it has, I, I think, a very important uh, impact uh, on society, and society would be um, for the loser, if if we lost the amount of uh, impact that uh, that a religion has. A final question, based on your significant and lasting contribution to both international studies and the social and political role of business organizations, as well as director of Roots of Peace. Currently, the United States appears to be heading toward a policy of increased isolationism, which in turn carries international implications in terms of conflict resolution, human rights, and peacekeeping. Is there, or is there not, an increased role of large corporations behind such an American policy? No. Uh, well, okay, that's too simplistic of, a, of an answer. Are some corporations uh, uh, consistent with uh, these policies? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about, uh, let's, let's just restrict it to uh, the largest corporations. You can find some that are consistent with that, but the answer is no in terms of the vast majority. Uh, they realize that it's not in their interest to um, uh, uh, adopt such a, a point of view. Uh, this is a matter of uh, really our president and his focus. Uh, Trump is is basically uh, isolationist in the sense of America is American America first uh, policies. Uh, the way he has dealt with. Uh, uh, countries, both uh, our traditional uh, allies, and also how he has dealt with countries that are uh, dictatorships. And um, I don't, I don't view this as uh, the result of a uh, big push by large corporations. Since I indicated before, many of them see themselves as the losers with this type of policy. Pardon me. I mean, trade policy, for example, has been hasn't been a winner for the United States. It's been a loser, and it's been a loser uh, for the, for the companies and also for American, uh, just the American public. So, uh, don't I don't see this as a result of a uh, uh, corporate influence. With your last answer, we may conclude our interview. Many thanks for your time and your precious collaboration. In closing, would you like to send any open message to the youth who are about to make their choice to enroll to a university? Yes, I, I do. And I say this as one whose grandson is in the process of deciding in terms of a, of a university. I think you have to look for an institution that uh, is consistent with 
of your personal objectives and your professional objectives. Uh, if you have a, an interest in a particular discipline, uh, say you're in uh, engineering uh, or um, humanities, look for institutions that are particularly strong in these areas. Uh, look for institutions who um, uh, have a uh, ambiance a, that is consistent with your uh, with your personality and your needs. Uh, for example, my daughter is uh, a product of uh, uh, UC Berkeley's ladder education, undergraduate and graduate. My son went to a small liberal arts college uh, because uh, this was a better fit, uh, better fit for him. He thrived uh, within it and is springboard uh, towards a very, very successful career. So, um, in a place that just feels comfortable to you in terms of your career objectives, your personal objectives, uh, the values, the values, I'll emphasize that again, the values that you have, uh, because institutions differ vastly in terms of their cultures. But uh, it has to be a place where you can thrive. And uh, I, I say this realizing that there are limitations and choices that students have uh, because of uh, finances, because of uh, family obligations, because of uh, family traditions, whatever. Uh, but as much as you possibly can, choose the one that uh, uh, in your in your gut, in your stomach, feels to be the right choice. And, um, and good luck to uh, all the prospective students who are considering the United States or who in here in Europe. Uh, members of the EU have a wonderful opportunity to study in different uh, countries uh, and, and different institutions as part of their education. Take advantage of it. Thank you again, Professor.